Okay, I suppose I'll just begin, right? If some people are late, then they won't miss that much in the beginning. Okay. <clears throat> um, is everything all right? Okay. I'd like to talk for um, a bit about the state of the Haskell infrastructure in the OpenSUSE family of distributions. Um, I have split the talk a bit in, in, in two parts, and the first part is basically supposed to introduce people who know about OpenSUSE but who have no idea about Haskell. Um, I'd like to show a bit of the language Haskell and why it might be worthwhile to look into that and why OpenSUSE distributions are a good place to, to do that. And the second part of the talk is then geared towards people who may be developing in Haskell but who don't know that much about OpenSUSE and who would like to know how do I set up my development environment, how do I deploy my, my programs, and uh, last but not least, I'd like to share a couple of uh, experience and insights into what uh, it feels like to manage a package set of about 2,200 packages these days, which we, uh, as I learned today, I think except 100 of those which are still in the submission queue, everything else is actually available in factory these days. So there was a quite an <laughs> interesting effort to get that done. Um, so Haskell, it's a, I, don't, I suppose that everybody who's here has heard the, the name at least. Um, the language has a, a couple of, of very nice properties that I enjoy about it very much. And since um, I, for the most time of my life, I was a C++ programmer, um, what I like about Haskell very much is the concise syntax. It's uh, very much inspired by the notation of mathematics, and mathematical notation is arguably very successful. It's been developed for 2,000 years or longer, and it's extremely expressive and short. And it's the same in Haskell. If you program in Haskell, your source code is crisp and clean, and you can read it easily. If you write C++, a generic function, then you have all kinds of boilerplates. You have to inherit iterator traits. You have to have all kinds of template keywords. You have to have a structure around it, define operators and whatnot, and you have 80 lines of code for like one line of payload. And in Haskell, this is very much different. So this is real source code all, and when you define a function that's supposed to square some value, then this is all you write. So there is no boilerplate at all. Um, all these, you'll find that this is fairly similar to Python. In Python, you could write an almost identical definition of square. You'd have a couple of extra brackets and you'd have a def keyword at the beginning. But the difference is that this is actually a statically typed language. So all these functions and all these constants have a very precise, very accurate type that is verified at compile time and you cannot use them in an unsafe way. In the next slide, we'll see what, what's going on. And so the square function is fairly, fairly obvious. Then you have a nice feature that um, this uh, modulo function, MOD, um, is a normal function. It takes two arguments and returns uh, a, a result. And what you can do in Haskell is that if you put the function name in these backticks, then you can write it between your operands. So you could write mod x2 equals equals zero, or you can write it this way and use it like an operator, which is sometimes more expressive. You have uh, list comprehensions. So if you see the definition of this list of, of integer values there, these all these three definitions are all equivalent. And uh, you have the list comprehension syntax, which everyone who is familiar with math will, will recognize. You have um, the second line uses um, a higher order function. So you have uh, filter is a, a standard function which iterates over all elements of that list which is given as the third argument and applies this uh, attribute to each of them and whenever is even returns true, the result is kept in the list and if is even returns false, the result is dropped from the list. And so you can create the list of even numbers which is ultimately the same thing as that third line and you could write it just like that in Haskell and would get the same result. And what is also kind of nice about this, this is an infinite list. So this list has no end. And it contains all the numbers. Um, you can think of it like a generator in Python, right? It's not actually a list, but it's know-how that tells you how to generate that list if you consume it. Then for the last example is the odd numbers. 
there is also, here is a feature that's particularly nice that's uh, currying. So what this does is the plus operator is a function that takes two arguments. And when I provide one argument already, then this turns into a function that takes one argument and gives a result, right? So one argument has been bound already. And you know the same thing from, from C++ maybe, but in C++ you have an explicit bind function to do this. And in Haskell you can just write the argument there and transform the function into one that has one argument less. And then you end up with something you can map over this list of even numbers to get at the, the result you get there. So this, all this code tends to be extremely short and, and expressive, even though it encodes fairly sophisticated uh, concepts. Um, the Haskell type system is very nice. It's a, a static, uh, statically typed language. It has very strong typing. So unless, uh, unlike in, in C, for instance, if you have a, a function that expects a signed integer and you pass it an unsigned integer, then this is a compiler error. You can't do that. You have to explicitly convert these different types and catch the uh, overflows or underflows if you, if you want to. But uh, the thing is you can't, types are very strictly enforced. And when we look at this, this square function from the last slide, it has a very accurate type, right? It takes some type A and returns some other type A. So the information is we don't know what type it is, but it takes returns the same type as it gets. And there is one constraint on that type. You can't just pass it anything, but you can pass it only things that are instances of the class num. And the class num, this is the definition, or a short abbreviated definition, has the distinguishing feature that it defines this operator. So it makes perfect sense intuitively, right? So if you use this operator here, then you can use this function only on things for which this operator is defined. Again, this is something that you would be able to do in Python as well, right? If you have a Python function square like this and you pass it something that has a multiplication operator, then it works, right? But the difference here is that if I define a new type, foo for instance, and then we define the multiplication operator for this, then this is perfectly legitimate code, right? You can multiply foo in this way. But you cannot pass foo to square because this multiplication here is not the same multiplication as this one. So the only way you'll be able to pass foo into the square function is if you define foo to be an instance of num. So you explicitly say, I fulfill this interface, and if this data type fulfills this interface, then you can use it. And so all the fundamental concepts of uh, different kinds of numbers, integrals, floating point numbers are abstracted in type classes in Haskell. And all the code that you write always works for all instances of that class. So when you write mathematical function, then you can use them with a, a double or you can use them with a multi-precision GMP whatnot object, which takes lots and lots of memory. This is, you don't care, right? This is the same thing for you. Another very nice feature is <clears throat> the uh, ability to define polymorphic uh, algebraic data types. So for instance, an optional value is typically encoded in a maybe. This, this data type has two ways to construct it. You can construct it with a just and the actual value, or you can construct it saying nothing. And then this is a type you can pass to a function. For instance, this function is going to, is going to greet someone and you pass the name of the person it's supposed to greet. And if you pass it with just world, it's going to say hello world. And if you pass nothing, then it's going to say hello stranger as a default, right? And so this is a very concise way to, to express an optional value. And you unresolve this ambiguity through pattern matching. So you just write multiple cases of your function and the one that matches is going to be the one that's chosen. And uh, then there is another feature which is arguably the most mind boggling one and that's uh, referential transparency or it's called a lazy evaluation is the, the common name. And what that means is that, no, not, la um, not lazy evaluation, excuse me. Um, it's a pure functional, purely functional. What that means is that the result of a function depends only on its arguments. So basically Haskell guarantees that if you call a function with one argument and you get some result, then every time you call that function with that argument, you'll get the same result. 
And this means that the compiler can optimize all common expressions anywhere in your source code that take the same arguments away and compute them once and replace the result everywhere. For instance, this function which uh, computes the length of a list, if you call it 10 times with the same list, you will get 10 times the same result. So now contrast that to the function string length that you know from C, for instance. If you pass string length a pointer, then this is the re this is the argument to your to your function, right? And now string length is going to iterate over the memory until it finds a zero byte, and it's going to return the number of bytes it could iterate until then. So now, if you change the underlying memory and call the function again with the same pointer, you'll get a different result because the memory has changed, right? So there is a hidden state somewhere, the memory in the machine, which is not visible in this type because the pointer you pass is both times the same pointer. And consequently, this is a function you cannot write in pure Haskell. So this function cannot exist, right? Because it violates the guarantee of referential transparency. And the reference transparency is nice for the compiler because it allows for great opportunities for optimization. But where it's really beneficial is for software engineers because what it means is that functions have no hidden state. If you have a function that, that is a pure mathematical function, it takes five arguments and then all it does is work with those five arguments. There's no other global variable, there is no <laughs> hidden state somewhere in a class method, it doesn't exist. It's just the arguments that you pass and those determine what the function does. So if you read Haskell code, then you can read it one function at a time and you always have a complete algorithm that does something with, with the arguments it takes. Of course, you can go through all kinds of contortions to make the code unreadable anyway, right? But it, most of the time it's actually fairly difficult. <laughs> And then this is another crazy scheme, and this is lazy evaluation, which I was referring to before. So in Haskell, um, a Haskell program is evaluated from, from the end. So the compiler looks at what is the program going to return when it terminates? What's the end result? And then it goes backwards through the source code and finds all the expressions it needs to compute that result, and everything that it doesn't need, it doesn't compute. So, for instance, this is a list of integer. And every single element of that list is going to throw an exception. So this list, this for instance, is going to throw an uh, arithmetic error. This is going to throw an undefined exception. This is going to throw a violated assertion. And here we have a Boolean which says this list has three items or we throw an exception. So now the question is, what happens when you evaluate that? when you ask the compiler, give me the value of B. And the answer is, you don't know. And this is actually for surprising reasons. So the compiler is completely at liberty to evaluate this part. And if it does, it throws an exception. Or it can evaluate this part. And in this case, it's going to return true. The reason is, when you look at the definition of length, The function that computes the, the, the list, right? It does pattern matching on the list. It says, give me the first element, give me the rest of the list, and then it does the recursion. But this value is never actually required. As far as the function is con uh, concerned, this is just an entry in the list, and I don't care what the entry actually is. This is not evaluated. So when you compute the length of that list, this is going to come out as three. There is no except exception because none of those items is ever evaluated. You don't need to evaluate them to compute the length of the list. And so this Boolean is either true or it's user error fail. And you don't know which one. So lazy evaluation has some mind-boggling consequences. It's sometimes very, very difficult to predict what's going to happen when you have complex code that has these properties. But the thing is that Lazy evaluation um, helps combat a very dangerous thing called a premature optimization. Because 
when you know that things that I don't need are not going to be evaluated and they don't cost me anything, it doesn't mean that you, it means you don't have to optimize them. If you think of an, an parser that parses an XML document, for instance, the XML document has like a thousand fields. So now you can devise a data type that contains all those thousand fields and it very nicely parses them and it turns the strings into numbers where it's a number and where it's an email address, it parses the email address and it gives you a very nice, very structured, sophisticated uh, representation of the XML file. And now somebody who is processing that XML file uses your library and says, yeah, I just want, I don't know, the first, the first element. I don't want the rest. It means that your parser is not going to pass any of the rest. It just passes the first element, says, here's your result, and that, that, that's that. So you can define, you don't have to, this notion that you have to abort the computation at some point, you don't have to care about that. The runtime system does that for you. There is uh, a lot more. <laughs> there is, uh, Haskell is, as far as I know, the most popular language in, 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 in uh, language research, in compiler research, in type system research, and there is a lot of work going on. You have a, an interactive development environment, which people who've programmed Python know that you have this, this interactive shell in which you can call any function and you'll get the result, and this works particularly well in, in, in a purely functional language, because if you have a function that depends only on its arguments, that means you can call it in any context, right? There is no hidden state. So you don't have to set up some elaborate environment to call your function. You just pass it the arguments and then it works. So this is actually very nice for, for, for development. The type system in Haskell compilers is uh, crazy. There is a, a, they're working, the, the thing people are working on these days is dependent types and linear types. And this is all very interesting research stuff that, that's being prototyped essentially in that language. You have uh, another thing which I personally love is asynchronous exceptions. In Haskell, um, you have you can have any number of threads that are computing in parallel. You can have thousands of threads, doesn't matter. It's quite common to do that. And now one thread can throw an exception to another thread. And that exception is going to arise at whatever point that other thread is currently evaluating. So this means when you look at, at your source code and you're thinking, what exception can happen now? The answer is everything. Every exception can happen. At every point of your source code, everything can fail with every error. Because another thread might throw you that thing, and then you get it, and it's your exception. And this is also something that boggles your mind in the beginning, because there is no such thing as code that can't fail. But it's actually a very accurate representation of what computers are, because when you assume this can't fail, you're probably wrong. And Haskell guarantees you, yeah, you are wrong. This can fail, and this can fail with any error. You have to deal with everything at any point. There is a software transactional memory. It's probably hard to explain. It's a, a way to write um, transactions without locking, which is very nice because it allows you to write composable uh, software. There is uh, the support for parallel computation is excellent. So when you write code in Haskell and you have a thousand threats all evaluating in parallel. That's perfectly normal. That's, that's very efficient. Uh, you can use uh, theorem solvers to prove properties of your code. And last but not least, if you want to, you can cross compile the entire thing to JavaScript and run it in a web browser. It's uh, very nice. So now you're thinking, man, this Haskell doesn't sound so bad. I want to try it. And on OpenSUSE, that's actually very simple. So first of all, you need the basic development environment, and this is the compiler, GHC. And this, uh, the compiler and Cabal install is the build driver which you use to build your package to do your interactive development. This is typically something you'll want. Um, this is a part of, uh, in Tumbleweed, you have the latest version of, of everything all the time. We, we update that, that basically once a week. Um, in Leap, you're going to have in Leap uh, 42.3, you're also going to have the latest version of everything. In uh, Leap 42.2, you don't have that right now. You have an older compiler and an older package set, which is still fine for most purposes, but it's not the bleeding edge because we stop updating that at a certain point so that we don't break our users' applications that they may have written. 
Then for installing libraries that you want to work with, there is a central repository called Hackage, and people who write libraries that you can reuse typically register them on Hackage. So you have this large database of things that you can browse. And for every package that is on there, you can typically try ghc dash the name of that package dev devil and install that and there is a really big chance that it will just work. So in OpenSUSE we distribute um, a subset of hackage which is called um, stackage. That's a variant, it's called stable hackage. So we don't distribute everything that's up there, but we distribute a subset that um, fulfills certain requirements like it's regression tested regularly, there is a an address where you can report errors to and they are actually fixed in some some reasonable time frame so the author maintains the package well and there is uh, yeah certain quality insurance mechanisms in place and I think stackage covers today about 2,200 packages which is I don't know maybe a fifth of package or so but the most interesting libraries are in there and we have all of them in Tumbleweed. And I think we have almost all of them in Open, uh, in, 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 in Leap as well. Um, and last but not least, um, there are tools written in, in Haskell which are no development library and you can install those like, like any other tool. For instance, Pandoc is an extremely nice uh, utility to convert text formats from one format to another. And, uh, the Haskell compiler, of course. And all of this is available via Zipper. So now suppose you are on um, an older distribution or you are on the commercial branch of, of SUSE Linux and you don't have those packages right away available or you have them available in a version that doesn't suit your needs, then what you can always do, you can register any of those development projects which exist on, on OBS. Um, the command is a bit unwieldy, but uh, I think, yeah, you can figure it out if you want to. So basically what happens is that this LTS package set, it gets created at a certain point, it gets a version number like LTS 6, and then the updates of new packages go in only if they don't break the API. So if there is a bug fix update, it will be updated in that package set, but if there is an update that breaks the API, it will not get into that package set. And then every Every year or so, there is a new LTS version where they say, okay, latest of everything, and then we start the whole process over. So within that package set, you have a stable development environment, and then you have different versions that use different major versions of the Haskell packages. And you can basically choose between any of those. So the latest one is currently LTS version 8. That's the one that we distribute here in this project, which is the development project for Factory. And so when you say you're on Leap 42.2 and you want the latest Haskell versions, the latest Haskell compiler, you can, you can just add that repository to your, to your zipper installation and it will work fine. Then suppose you've written a nice application in Haskell, a web application, say, and you want to deploy that on a whole bunch of machines and, and actually use it to provide services on the internet. Then this is a, a problem that the Haskell community has traditionally struggled with, and this is where I, I can just invite every Haskell hacker who wants to, to do that, give, open, give OpenSUSE a try, because here it's actually very simple. The first thing that you can do, say you have written your application and you want to deploy it. The easiest way you can do that is just upload it to Hackage, get it registered into Stackage, and then it takes a week or so, and then we'll have it and we'll distribute it for you. So once you publish your code and you release it as free software, then OpenSUSE Tumbleweed is automatically going to pick it up. And that means you can install it everywhere. Now, maybe that's not suitable for you for some reason. Maybe, I don't know, the code is not open source or maybe Tumbleweed is not for you. Then you can always use the build service, which is also for everyone who doesn't know that, this is maybe the most useful service at all in all of OpenSUSE. You can get an account here for free, you can upload spec files for your packages, and this thing will build them and will test them for you and it will distribute binaries for you and you can just use them wherever you want. The um, 
the spec files that you do, you don't have to write them manually. You can generate them automatically for your Haskell projects. There's a tool called Cabal RPM, which is part of OpenSUSE, of course. And you can feed a Cabal file through that and you get a spec file out of it that you can register here and build your own application on the open build service. And then you can install it everywhere. And last but not least, if you have a crazy complicated infrastructure that depends on very specific versions of very specific packages and, and this is all a lot of work, then you can use the tool that we use to, to build those development projects, which is called Cabal to OBS. It's open source, it's on GitHub, you can fork it, you can change, edit the package set, run it, and then upload your own package set to the uh, open build service and build very specialized environments that are particularly well suited for your needs. So in Haskell, builds are described by something called um, Cabal. There is a very clever abbreviation like common architecture for building things. I don't, I don't remember. Um, and this is basically a plain text file which contains some meta information about your package, like what it's called, what's the version, what's the license, uh, a short description, a synopsis, all these things that, that every package basically has. And then you also have, for instance, um, a library or an executable component in your, your package, and these can depend on other Haskell packages like here. And then they have this extra library stance, so they can depend on system libraries. In this example, for instance, the package depends on OpenSSL and wants Zipper to install that for you for your build. Here you have an executable which depends on Pandoc and example on the library. And so this is something, if you're developing a Haskell package, this is a file you are going to write. This is something you'll probably do. And once you have that, you can generate a spec file from that automatically. And obviously this is the process that we also use um, when we this 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 project with those 2,000 builds in there, we update it automatically from those those Cabal files. We um, download we download the Cabal files from um, from Hackage with a tool which is essentially a build system, right? It's written in Haskell, and uh, so we basically get the latest version of everything, and then we rebuild the repository and the process. I'm going to show it in more detail on the next slide, but the process basically creates the spec file. Then we have, uh, in this case, this update only shows an update for Pandoc for LTS 8, but obviously we update all kinds of packages in all kind, kinds of, of package sets. This is just one example to make it fit on the slide. So suppose that version has an update, then we generate the, generate the spec file for it. We run spec cleaner over it. We basically run spec cleaner over everything. So we want our spec files to have a very consistent consistent look and, and we want spec cleaner to be a no op when you run it on it. And then <clears throat> for some packages, um, the cabal file maybe doesn't contain sufficient information or maybe we have additional features we'd like to enable and then we have a set of patches that may be applied to every of those packages to patch the spec file into, I don't know, to add additional features or fix the license tag, like in this case. And again, after every patch, we always run spec cleaner. And in the end, it says done, uh, took seven seconds. And now we have this LTS8 package set. And this is essentially a checkout from OBS, which we then commit, and that's that. So this whole update process, I guess the point is the whole update process is automatic. There is no human, my, I mean, sometimes something breaks because of a bug somewhere, but for the most part, this is completely automatic. So this package set is always in an up-to-date state and nobody's actually manually doing anything about it, which is uh, particularly nice. So when we generate the package set, we have this Cabal to AVS utility, which also implements a lot of, of checks, uh, which we learned over time are fairly important. So for instance, sometimes people specify a name of a license that doesn't exist and we know that's going to fail the review so if we detect anything like that we abort the build immediately then people write all kinds of nonsense into their package descriptions uh, oftentimes it's something like c read me which doesn't help us much sometimes it's just plain nonsense or it's something they copy pasted from the wrong package 
and uh, we make a good effort to detect these cases where these things don't add up and also abort the build so that we can fix it manually. And also what something people often do in Cabal files is that they confuse documentation and data files, that they say, I have a readme and it's a data file, but no, it's a readme, it's documentation. And then we try to automatically fix that in the spec file so that our users have a find the readme in the proper location. Okay, so we generate the whole package set. This is completely automatic. Then we commit it into this devil project, into the LTS8 project, which is a bit of a staging area. For the most part, things just compile. Sometimes there is a build error for some reason. Then we manually fix the build errors. And then when this, this uh, development project is in a state where everything compiles, then we synchronize it into the proper development project for, for OpenSUSE Factory. And once it's in that project, it's going to submit, it's going to be submitted to Factory mostly automatically. There is this um, OBS auto submitter, a nice service that the, the OBS team runs, and it will automatically pick up the updates and submit them to, to Factory. And then they'll show up in Tumbleweed a couple of days later if we're lucky. So this whole stuff is all living on GitHub. Um, the URL is on the next slide, I think. Um, so you can mess with that. You can take a look at it if you, if you want to. And the repository that we have contains obviously the, the package sets, the lists of packages and versions that we distribute. We have a bunch of packages that are not part of Stackage, but that we distribute anyway because they are useful for some reason. Um, we have, in some cases, explicit build settings where we change defaults because we enable features that are not on by default or something like that. And then we have a set, a whole bunch of patches that um, improve the, the generated spec files. And I, l I counted those, those things yesterday and I was very surprised that uh, we have actually uh, well over 230 packages that declare their license incorrectly. And this is, uh, I think, the single most uh, reason for failed reviews when we submit those things. So people, they say in their Cabal file, I have a BSD2 license, and then they have a BSD3 license file in there. Or some people say, I'm GPL, and in fact, they are an MIT license. And this is all very common. I don't know how people do that, but it's very common. So people have no idea what license their package is under. And then we fix it for them. This is, I have to say, one of the things that is really nice about OpenSUSE, because when you download this stuff from, from us, then you can actually trust the, the license. So when the spec file says, this is a BSD2 package, then it is a BSD2 package. But if you download it from, from Hackage, then it might not be. But in OpenSUSE, you have had a lawyer actually look at it and make sure that this information is accurate. So this is, I think, quite a, a nice added value. We have lots of fixes for, for package descriptions that didn't make any sense. Um, sometimes people upload release tarballs where files are missing, then we add them, add them for them again, and all kinds of things, right? I mean, distributing software is not as easy as it looks. Okay. So if you want to know more, then these are the places to look at. Obviously, the Haskell website has the, uh, the complete standard for the language. It has links to tutorials and everything. Stackage um, is the, the place to look for the stable package sets if you want to mess with that. This is the repository for our software that we use to develop everything. And this is the development project in OBS. Okay, I think it was fairly quick. So thank you very much for your attention, and if you have any questions, then shoot. Uh, is there any plan to make uh, uh, Haskell available on ARM uh, in OpenSUSE? It is. It is not available for ARM v7, for the 32-bit port. Or at least I didn't find any. So the development project here. Um, well, maybe maybe I can help out here. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Peter Trommler. I'm the uh, the maintainer of the compiler, so I'm actually responsible for uh, 
initiating the 2000 uh, packages uh, attack, if you want to call it that. Um, currently, I haven't, uh, we, we haven't installed the, the 32 bit uh, binaries for, uh, for GHC, for, for ARMS. Um, personally, I don't know if, if, if I find the time to do it. But uh, others have uh, submitted um, a bootstrapping compiler. That's what we're missing in the past. And I mean, we could try. I don't know. I think we need a certain version of LLVM for the ARM port to work. And, and the right version of LLVM is not available in, um, in the last uh, leap version uh, for... Um, 8.2 GHC version that's going to come out in June, I think. Um, well, that's the plan of, of uh, GHC headquarters. They said they're going to support LLVM 3.9 or maybe even 4.0. And we have both of those in, in factory or in tumbleweed. And I could give it a shot if I find the time or if somebody else wants to jump on it. I mean, just, just send uh, pull requests to... Uh, to develop languages Haskell and I'll look at it and, and enable it if, if I can. But be a bit patient with the 8.2. Um, it's not my main job. <laughs> my students would get very angry if I said, well, I'm not preparing the lectures because I have to do the Haskell compiler. Um, I've got another question. So you know, I'm from a university where we are working with like tools regarding for application field of data mining. Is there something uh, like tools like NumPy and SciPy available? I know, sorry, this is a probably dumb question, but are there tools like NumPy and SciPy like Pandas for um, reading in data and processing it? Um, does anyone here in the audience also knows of that? Because that would be quite cool to apply Besides yeah. Python, um, there is a, a special interest group in the Haskell community that's concerned with data mining, machine learning, and they have uh, produced a whole set of libraries. There is uh, something, a very comprehensive binding to R, which allows you to mix R and Haskell, so you can write Haskell code and seamlessly interface to R and share results, which I think is probably a very good solution because R has uh, the most sophisticated libraries in this area, right? And you have uh, explicit machine learning libraries and visualization libraries that are written in Haskell. So uh, I don't know, I, I'm not an expert in this field, so I don't know whether the, the stuff is as good as the Python libraries are, but there certainly is a sophisticated infrastructure there. Yeah, and it's open source, right? <laughs> Well, thank you very much.